top of the world, rising like a frozen giant out of the ice-bound sea, lies Greenland, remote Danish colony locked against the rest of civilization by chains of massive ice. Behind her forbidding rampart stands America's most northern military outpost, the air base of Thule. Defying howling blizzards, blinding snow, dense fog, in temperatures of 50 below, America's first line of defense stands its frosty vigil. Thrusting 700 miles into the Arctic Circle, Thule was built with permission of the Danish government. Born out of strategic necessity and given the name Operation Blue Jay, its story is one of the greatest military sagas of our time. It all began back in the States. It was a triumph of teamwork between the armed forces. The Army with its engineer and transportation corps, the Navy with its military sea transportation service to carry thousands of tons of equipment and supplies and its decapitated LSTs, their superstructures chopped off at deck level and destined to end their days as piers in Thule's harbor. The Air Force, with its military air transport service, delivering its share of the vital priority cargo. Civilians, draftsmen, architects, and skilled workers, private construction companies and engineers all combined in the nation's biggest and most secret military project since the Normandy invasion, the building of an impregnable air base at the frozen roof of the world. And now, at last, the story can be told. While tons of equipment were piling up at the Great Norfolk staging area for Operation Blue Jay, 2,000 miles away at Rosemont, Minnesota, a great pool of labor was being interviewed. Stringent tests eliminated all but the hardiest, most highly skilled applicants. Each man was instructed in how to survive in the bleak Arctic. Each man learned the use of cold weather gear and through the use of diagrams and charts was taught to lift the heaviest equipment without injury. Bear the main force. Temporary shelter was provided by the Atwell hut, a complete building shipped as a single package. In a matter of hours, a small village popped up complete with living and eating quarters, administration buildings, and hospital. To determine the nature of Thule's frozen terrain, soil experts bored deeply into the ice-covered earth for samples. Below the top layer, a few feet under the surface, they discovered beds of fossil ice and perpetually frozen earth. The Navy's underwater demolition team, known as Frogmen, helped to clear the harbor of underwater obstacles. While on the beach, demolition teams coordinated their charges to clear the ice. The Frogmen, looking like men from Mars in their underwater masks and rubber fins, returned to the safety of their temporary ice flow base. This volunteer elite corps trained off the beaches of California and Virginia, spearheaded amphibious landings in World War II, and are as at home in the frigid Arctic waters as they were in the warm Pacific. Superb athletes with physique and endurance high above average, these rugged men played a vital part in the Thule operation. The beach is open, courtesy of underwater demolition team. On June 6, 1951, the Great Armada cast off and followed the North Star. 82 ships with a cargo valued at 125 million. 3,500 men of the Army Engineers, Signal and Transportation Corps. Hundreds of civilian specialists. And leading the great fleet, the Coast Guard's rugged icebreakers, the veterans Edisto and Eastwind. Almost 4,000 miles of perilous seas lay ahead. Ahead lay mountainous waves. Ahead lay dreaded icebergs. Bitter cold. Ahead lay the interminable ice. Frozen lily pads pockmarking the seas as far as the eye could see gradually gave way as the ships plowed north to enormous ice flows where schools of walrus played.
until finally the sea became a floor of ice, solid, frozen, impenetrable. The convoy halted, trapped in a frozen vice. Then, battering ahead with their heavy-jawed bows, the icebreakers smashed through, hacking, crushing, grinding out a trail for the convoy to follow. Helicopters took off on ice reconnaissance. They scouted over the brilliant Arctic waste for leads in the ice through which the convoy could safely pass. Past ominous chunks of ice. Through the open sea lane, ripped out by the workhorse icebreakers, the convoy crept forward. Slowly, doggedly, day by day, mile by mile, sometimes yard by yard. Liberty and victory ships, landing ship tanks, landing ship docks, ducks, lighters, tugs, and hundreds of smaller landing craft followed the doughty icebreakers, who had led them safely through the treacherous seas to their chilled and bleak destination. On July 6th, the giant fleet dropped anchor in Thule Harbor. From the shore, the Navy's beachmaster directed the flow of traffic as supplies began to pour ashore around the clock. What had been an empty harbor a few short hours ago was suddenly transformed into a great humming port as battalions of ducks darting between the ice like seagoing freight cars shuttled cargo from ship to shore in a steady crescendo of unloading. Heavy earth-moving equipment was disgorged from the huge jaws of the LSTs in bad weather as well as good, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until over 153,000 tons of cargo were piled on the beach. Vast stockpiles of fuel and oil for Thule's hundreds of machines were quickly built up. Construction workers ferried ashore from their temporary homes aboard transports got their first look at the Arctic wasteland where they would erect a mighty air base. The builders from the hilly midlands of America would soon become familiar with this strange frozen world. This was one port where the sailors did not want liberty. Favorite records were broken out and jive music echoed through the compartments. For ashore, these were the only glamour girls. Yes, it was really a dog's life. With the coming of the short summer, work was accelerated. Quarries were mined, and the rock and earth fill spread and leveled on the site where the fuel tanks, hangars, barracks, and a mighty airstrip would swiftly rise. Tons of molten tar were sprayed upon rock and gravel, smoothed down, packed Height. Construction moved along speedily on all fronts. The site for the huge oil tanks was also prepared with an earth pad of rock and gravel and sprayed with oil. Thus, each tank would be protected from the Arctic frost. The steel walls of the tanks began to rise with spectacular speed erected by specialist iron workers who had put up similar tanks everywhere throughout the world. Work went on into the twilight hours of the midnight sun. At the same time, pipelines, vital arteries for the entire operation, were stretched across ditches and ravines to the tankers anchored more than a mile away, waiting to pump the life-giving oil into the mammoth tanks. As the runways began to take shape, nearby reinforced concrete was being poured for the hangar floors. Blocks of foam glass provided insulation additional insurance that hangar heat would not melt the frozen earth below. 
Iron workers assembled the giant hangar trusses. And in the freezing weather, pitching and catching enlivened the work of the riveting team. Hanger trusses and wall frames rose toward the sky. And when the building shell was completed, massive 200-ton doors closed out the hangar project. Meanwhile, living quarters, barracks for the construction crews and the men who would follow them were being built. Upon their completion, the workers would move in from their temporary quarters aboard the transport ship. Clements panels used in the states as refrigeration walls were standard building material for barracks, warehouses, and mess hall. Made of fireproof insulation, this prefabricated material was light and strong. More than 300,000 Clements panels were used at Thule. Dozens of barracks sprouted from Thule's soil. The ships used by the crews as barracks for the two long months received orders to sail. And as the buildings were completed, the workers moved in. Not exactly the Waldorf, but it was comfortable, warm, it was home. The modern mess hall, like the barracks, was put to instant use by the hard-working construction crews. While one shift was being served breakfast, the second shift, on the other side of the mess hall, was eating its evening meal. In the careful planning for the personal needs of the men, recreation and relaxation was not forgotten, nor was spiritual guidance. On October 1st, the nearly completed base was visited by Lieutenant General Curtis LeMay, the chief of the Strategic Air Command. He was briefed by the district engineer. Soon, the all-important control tower would be flashing its signals. Soon, the final touches would complete the historic Thule operation. And today, from this mighty air base behind our Arctic rampart, America stands ready to protect the freedom of the world.